Good morning. This is Melissa at Safe Haven, and I'm so excited about the teaching today. This is what I did in class, and it's not the whole thing, but it's part of it. And I was teaching on Welcome Holy Spirit. So today I want you kind of to tuck in and get ready, and I'm going to be talking about the Spirit of God. He's a precious, precious Spirit. So, first of all, I want to say that God is, is a one, we have one God, Jehovah God. He is called a Trinity because there are three distinct parts. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, whatever you want to say. And those parts are equal. Uh, God the Father is equal to the Son, is equal to the Spirit. So, we, we can't look at one as lesser than the other. The other thing I want to say is they have different functions. We know that in the in the book of Genesis, when God said, let there be light, it was the Holy Spirit that brought light. Uh, the Father issues the plan, and the Holy Spirit activates that plan on earth. That's part of his job. He's called comforter, helper, advocate, uh, counselor, all of these words. It's his job to draw us to Jesus. Get us saved. Get us saved. That's what he does. And so he puts a drawing spirit. Have you ever been in a church service and the spirit of God was so heavy in there and they were playing something like just as I am and you're sitting there just crying thinking, oh my gosh. Well, that was the spirit drawing you and, and, and really prompting you to come to Christ. Um, we also know that he has the job of taking us from where we are right now all the way across till we get to the other side. And we may go through a lot of stuff getting there, but Spirit, the Spirit will get us there. And he'll get us there, and we will stand before Jesus one day, and it will be a good thing. Now, I'm about to reintroduce to you the God that we saw in Genesis. We saw the Spirit. He's there in Exodus, Leviticus, all these books, all the way through the Bible. But there's a special book to me that tells us an awful lot about the Spirit who was there at the beginning of the church. And that's the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he started to fire. I mean, he started to fire. Now, he did. And that flame went from, from uh, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. When you start a fire like that, you can't stop it. And it was an amazing thing. You know, today it goes all the way around the world. Think about that. This gospel that started 2,000 years ago that nobody thought was going to last, oh yeah, it did. It sure did. I love it. Luke was chosen by God to write this book. And I think that's pretty neat because, you know, God knows our personalities. He knows who can write and who can't write. And he wanted a detail guy. So he picked Luke because Luke was a physician and he was in the details. He wanted to make sure everything was correct and accurate. So he wrote two books of the Bible. Now, if I say to you, what were those two books? Most of you know at least one of them. What's the book that's named after him? Luke. That's good. That's good. You're very good. Good Bible student right there. Well, he said in the book of Luke, he wanted to tell the truth about who Jesus was and, and talk about all the things that Jesus did. And then the second book, that he wrote is Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And that book was where we see the Holy Spirit introduced, but also the starting of the church and the first 30 years of the church. So I think this is going to be an interesting study in the book of Acts. Now, uh, the church did not, the church just exploded, but it didn't grow because people had a passion or uh enthusiasm. It grew because the Spirit of the Lord was in every decision they made, in everything they did. They were people of prayer. Now, I want to jump into the book of Acts, and I'm going to read some for you today. So, you can follow along in your Bible, and I think I'm probably in the in the New King James would be my guest. I can't remember right now. Acts 1, 1 to 3 says, in my former book, Theophilus, he's is addressing someone, and the word Theophilus actually means one who loves God. So it could be a specific person, or it could be just the body. of uh, the, just the body. Uh, he says, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Jesus, Jesus demonstrated 
what he did. He demonstrated it. If he preached it, then he demonstrated it. He preached on healing, he's, he was healing. If he preached on raising the dead, he was raising the dead. He, he was activating what he was speaking. And it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he'd chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a 40-day period and spoke about the kingdom of God. You know, this is like the rest of the story. I don't know how many of you listened to Paul Harvey, but he was one of my favorites. And the rest of the story is he's speaking to Theophilus. And, and this is big news, big news edition here. All of heaven's watching. Jesus was crucified on Passover. I want you to get a timeline here. On Passover. 50 days later was Pentecost. Now, on when he was crucified on Passover, for 40 days, he was he rose up from the from the grave and he was on earth. And what he was doing was appearing to all these people at least 10 times. We know he appeared to men and women, to the 500, to the disciples one-on-one, -on -one, two on two. But he did that. And when he did, and he, re and he reminded them of everything that, that his ministry was about and, and what his plans were, they, they changed. Something, when they saw him resurrected and talked with him, there was a change that couldn't be explained. You know, before they argued with each other, they, they, were de they deserted their Lord. Peter, Peter even denied even knowing Jesus. They were, they were a weaker man. But then when, the, when this happened, they became convinced in that resurrection that something was different. And now they came together. There was no more fighting. There was no more disagreeing. They were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke said they were eyewitnesses. Oh, I love this. Don't you love an eyewitness report? Because you know when somebody's there, they know what the truth is. Now, in Acts 1, 4 and 5, it says, Once when Jesus was eating with them, he commanded them, Don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, have you heard that verse before? Sure you have. In, and it's found in Luke three sixteen. It says, John answered their questions by saying, I baptize with water, but someone who is greater than me is coming, and he's so much greater, I'm not even worthy to be his slave or untie the straps of his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. We're going to see that in just a little bit. In the next couple of verses, oh, the, the disciples are saying, is it time, time for your kingdom to appear, Lord? And he said, I don't know the time. Only the Father knows that. He knows the season and the time, but I don't know that. And then in Genesis, or I'm sorry, in Acts 1.8, it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Have you ever noticed God always has a plan where we have to wait? I'm not good at waiting. If he's going to do it, let's just get her done. That's kind of my that's kind of my motto. Well, sometimes my motto isn't the best and and God's saying, "You know, you need to wait because if I'm not in it, it's not going to work. I want you to let me in and let me show you how to do what you need to do." It's like the verse in Zechariah 4:6. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Right after he gives them this word, Jesus is taken up in a cloud. And the Bible says in Acts 1, 10, and 11, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white came beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here looking into the sky? That same Jesus, that same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. And we know in the book of Revelation, it says he'll come back in the clouds. Every eye will see him, even the ones who pierced him and all the people of the earth. Every eye is going to see Jesus when he returns. And then in Acts 1, 
13 and 14, as soon as Jesus ascended on the 40th day, now there's 10 more days to Pentecost. And so the disciples went straight to Jerusalem. They got in, in the upper room. But I want you to listen to who's in that upper room. In Acts 1, 13, 14, it says this. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Now listen to this part, because I've had some people argue with me on this. They just thought it was men in the upper room. It was not. It says they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And his brothers. Why, why did they say and his brothers? Because the brothers really didn't understand Jesus at the beginning and they were not supportive of his ministry. But when they saw him resurrected, everything changed. And we know they go on to do things for the Lord. They Everything changed and they believed he was who he said he was. Suddenly Peter stands up, speaks to the disciples. And basically what he says is, because Judas failed, we need another disciple. But he has to be somebody who's also been an eyewitness to, the, to these things. And they narrowed it down to uh, Matthias, let's see, they narrowed it down to Justice and Matthias. And after they they took a, a they, they how do you, what do they call that? They chose, they chose who they wanted. It ended up being Matthias. He was the 12th disciple. Now we're going to go to Acts chapter two. And I want to, I want to mention again, 10 days, 120 people have been in that upper room with anticipation. And I believe heaven was excited. I, I think it was a time like they're going, oh my gosh, can you believe what's happening? They weren't sure what to expect on earth. And the reason for that is, is because the Holy Spirit, they'd already received it. See, if you look at John 20, verse 19 and 22, it says this. That Sunday evening, that was the night that Jesus was crucified. It says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because all of them were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus is standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And they were filled with joy because they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. And the Father has sent me, so send I you. And he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now they waited 10 days to see what God had for them. And then something happened. We're going to see that in a minute. See, they've been saved. When Jesus was resurrected, he gave them his Holy Spirit. If you're, if, if you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. But there's a difference between having the Spirit in you and, and another thing to have the Spirit have you. We can have the Spirit. That's inside us. But does the Spirit have us? That's the question. You're going to find that out in a minute. It's one thing to be born again, but it's another thing to be empowered in the Spirit. Power that comes from on high that causes you to be a witness for Jesus. Every believer has the Holy Spirit in them, but they don't all have the Spirit on them. Now, in that verse we read that said, you'll be a witness to me, that word witness is martus in the Greek, and what it actually means is you're willing to be a martyr for me. In other words, God, if everybody else is, is going their, their, their own way, I'm still with you. If everybody else comes against me and threatens me with prison and jail and maybe death, I'm still with you. I'm not backing down on this. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit can do in your life. Now, I'm going to go down just a little bit here. Uh, Simon, Simeon, I'm sorry, Simeon. Simeon got a word from the Lord and he said, to, he said, Simeon, you won't die until you get a glimpse of the Holy Spirit, of the, I'm sorry, of Messiah. And so Simeon was a smart cookie. He decided he'd stay in the temple all this time, and he did. 
Why did he did do that? Because if God makes a promise, you need to make sure that you're in a place you can receive that promise. And if it means that you have to stay in 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 church, in the the Word of God, if you have to continue praying, if you have if you need to be watching videos on YouTube about about him and what he does, whatever it is, you've got to keep your heart and your mind on God because he's got something amazing for you. Now, um, if we go down a little further, you see, do you remember the verse that says, uh, let me see if I can find that. It's the very first verse and it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. That was a miracle. How many of you know you can't get 120 people to agree on anything? Actually, we can't get three people to agree on anything. But they all were in accord. One mind, one accord. And, and it says everything's falling into place that God had planned. What's next? Well, Pentecost was fulfilled when Jesus poured out his spirit upon the believers. And that was the day the church was born. It was the day the church was empowered. I think that's pretty amazing. Now in verse 2 it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The word for, uh, for um, wind, couldn't think what that word was. <laughs> the word for wind is pneuma, pneuma. And that means the breath or spirit or air we've got some words in the english that actually have something to do with that think about pneumonia pneumonia that has to do with a lack of air in your lungs we have the word pneumatic drill which means that there is a, a compressed air it's it's it has to do with air and the word in the hebrew is ruach and they both mean spirit or wind and it said this mighty wind comes rushing through now remember they've already got the spirit inside of them and then when this wind came I'm telling you it, it, they were almost blown away literally there was dust flying in that upper room there was cobwebs being blown out there were anything that wasn't attached to, to it it was all moving see that's the way the Holy Spirit is when he comes upon us he knocks things off of us that we didn't even need to know needed to be knocked off now let's look at verse 3 and it said he appeared to them and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat on each one of them they had when the when the dust settled they're looking around at each other and every one of them had cloven tongues of fire in other words like uh, flames of fire on top of their head. So if you were in that upper room of the 120, you'd look around and 119 people had fire on their head. And you're watching this, but you couldn't see it on yourself. And there's a reason for that. How many of you know if you see the fire in somebody and you can go, man, they are on fire. They're doing this for Jesus and that for Jesus. And the person who's the one that they're looking at a lot of times has no idea the impact they're having. I think there's a reason for that. Because we get a head so big we couldn't get through the door. Amen? Now, in Acts 2, 4, it says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. If anybody tells you that you can learn to speak tongues, you need to head for the hills and run. Because that's not truth. Nobody can teach you. No man on earth can teach you to speak in tongues. This is from the Holy Spirit and Him alone. Now, uh, look at Acts 2.5. It says, Now that we're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. We're talking men, women, children from everywhere. They're going to list them in just a minute. In verse 6 and 7, it says, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't these guys speaking Galileans? In other words, aren't they kind of rednecks, these guys right here? This was a miracle. It was a miracle that they, the men were in the upper room, and they were just praising God, and everything was wonderful. And down below, you got all the people 
they're praying in tongues up, up above, just speaking in other tongues and praising God. That's called a prayer language, by the, by the way. Nobody had to interpret it. It was a prayer language, their language to God. And he's praying. And the neatest thing happened, down below, they're hearing it in their own language. But the word language also means in their own dialect. In their own dialect. In China, there's 200 dialects. Do you know there's 24 dialects in Fairfield? In Fairfield, there's 24 dialects in America. There is. There's one like, and that's like an accent. In the United States, we've got, uh, well, we've got the Southern accent, and we've got New England. We got that one. And then there's Western General America. And in my my class, I said, and then there's Fairfield. We have our own. We're pretty distinct, don't you think? No wonder they were amazed, and they and they just kept. Aren't these guys from Galilee? Listen to the number of, of places that were represented. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? The men in the upper room were lifting their voices to God, but the people below could hear him. No PA system, no big screen. They made it word of mouth from the disciples praising God right down to their ears. Hallelujah, that was a miracle. Acts 2.13, somehow, you know, you've always got to have somebody that throws poop on the whole thing. Well, here they are. Well, they said... Ah, uh, that's silly. They've had too much wine. And Peter gets up and says, stood with the eleven, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, and said, Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain something to you. Listen carefully. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. There's two or three things I want you to see here. First of all, Peter stood shoulder to shoulder with the other with the other men. And that's amazing in itself because before they were scrapping. One wanted to be on the right hand of Jesus and the other one on the left. But now Peter, who had, we call him the cock -a doodle do guy, he's the one that had denied Christ. He had a backbone like he hadn't had before. He straightened up and he said, let me tell you they're not drunk. Something else is going on. And he could say that because the devout Jews never ever drank wine in the morning or or anything they didn't drink anything or eat anything before nine o'clock that's their prayer time they had prayer at at nine at 12 and at three and so they would never have taken anything and today the orthodox jews are the same way christians are the only group that shoot their wounded if we shoot our wounded for Pete's sakes. We need to be together in unity. There's a beautiful verse in Psalms 133, 1 that says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. I love the word unity. And, and so Peter says, they are drunk. And he goes on to say in verse 16, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Whatever we do in church, we ought to be able to look back and say, we're doing this just like David did, just like Paul did, just like Moses did, just like Joel said. We need to be sure we're based, what we do is based on the word of God. Um, Acts 2, 17, this was uh, quoting Joel, the book of Joel. And in the last day, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in this, these days and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And, and then he says, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. He's talking about the second coming, but it started on the day of Pentecost when the church was founded. That's when the last day started. And you're thinking, how many more last days do we have? Well, here's the bad news and the good news. 
in Second Peter 3, 8, it says, With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. So basically, we're on day two. Day two. I'm just wondering how many days there are. Acts 2.21 says, And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know that during the tribulation, we'll be gone. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the first route out. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm planning on being gone. But during the tribulation, there will be those left behind. Those that never accepted Christ by grace and, and came into the kingdom. And so there'll be an amazing revival take place. And I believe that, and, and the word of God confirms that there'll be, there'll be signs and wonders in the heavens. And, and they'll, God will do everything he can to convince these believer, these non-believers to be believers. And this is the gospel according to Melissa. But you know what I think? I think in those last days, when those people are, are left behind, and, and they're trying to figure out what just happened, I think they're going to begin to go back in their mind. And those that were brought up when they were little, they're going to hear that song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They're going to hear it. And those that were in, in, a, in a church, and the music started to play, and they were weeping, but they, they couldn't move. Even though that song, just as I am without one plea, even though it started to play, they couldn't move. And they, they denied Christ. They, they said, I, I can't, I can't come right now. I believe every word you spoke, if it comes soon, I believe every word you've spoke, every seed you've planted, every, every um, Bible that's left behind, <laughs> everything. They're going to see it, and they're going to realize, wow, we missed something, and they're going to come to Christ. Amen? I'm excited about that. When that revival hits in the very, very last days, it will be something else. Let's just pray. Father, Father, thank you so much, so much for today. Thank you for your word. Now help us, Lord, as we go through the book of Acts to understand what you have for us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.